to understand data models, we have to learn about abstraction first. So if I were to show you this image of this heart with a lot of blood um, and this arrow going through it versus this box with some line, then I would say that this image is too realistic, but not that abstract. It's not right. And this one is too abstract doesn't really convey the meaning. But this one's just right. It shows the heart that is pierced with this arrow. So abstraction basically is the right amount of information that conveys enough meaning, but not too much meaning either that is not that makes the whole meaning irrelevant. So that's abstraction. Similarly in computer science, there's various levels of abstractions, right? When you write application code, uh, versus the algorithm that powers that application, the programming language that you use, another level deep into abstraction, which converts into assembly language, that converts into machine language, so on and so forth, until the physics, the magnetic fields that that uh, that captured the data information, right? So there's various levels of abstraction, and each of these layers serve the layer above it. Similarly, when we build our application, the very top layer is where we have data structures that represents the real life objects like the user, the post, the friends, likes. These are all real world objects and that can be represented in data structures. And then the second layer of abstraction is an API layer that converts that into you know, a JSON data or an XML um, data format, right? So that's the second level of abstraction that represents the same application object. The third level of abstraction beneath it is memory and disk that uh, tells uh, you know how this data is actually stored in in that memory right what what bytes represent one and zeros represent what how is those one and zeros actually stored that's the magnetic fields in the hardware level abstraction similarly when we design our application there is data abstraction right so let's take a real life example if i were to model a social network like facebook or linkedin with four entities users you and i are users and we have friends and we write posts and we have uh, friends who like our posts, right? So if you were to model this and uh, create the data model that supports this, what level of abstraction would you use, right? Um, so there are many ways of doing it. The most uh, fundamental uh, traditional way is a relational model. So if I were to model users, posts, friends, and likes, I would probably have a user table with uh, certain columns, uh, primary key user ID, and I'll have a username, uh, and then I'll have a post entity with primary key post ID, and then an author ID, which references my foreign key of a user. Similarly, I'll have a friends table that has the user ID, um, and then the friend ID um, created, timestamp, and you know, likes table. So I'll have a bunch of tables with foreign key references that you know make relationship between each of these. So that's a relational model way of going, going about uh, implementing this data model, right? And so how would we query this data model? We would query this data model with a bunch of joins, right? A select statement, right? We, we would join the likes uh, with the user and with friends, and we will get all of our friends who have liked any of our post, let's say. Then this is the query that you would end up writing. So this data model made us write this query. So that's an important thing to remember. Now let's see if there's another way of doing it. Yes, there is document-based model, where you model a user as a document store, right? Uh, and let's assume that you have a user ID, username, and friends with all of your friends, uh, uh, friends with user IDs here, right? Uh, and then you have posts. In each of your posts, anyone who likes is all captured as part of this array of likes, right? So if you, if you see that data locality for posts, if you want to find all of the likes of all of your, you know, of a given post, all you have to retrieve is that given post ID and you get all the likes. But in our case, if you want to query all of my friends who have liked any of my posts, now that becomes very complex. All of that logic, which was now given by the database engine, this join smartness is now have to be replicated into my application logic. In my application, what I'd have to do is I'll have to get all my posts and get all my likes and then get the deduplication of all the users from all of my likes. Then I have to get all my friends, get the deduplicated list of my friends, and then have a join in memory. All of that has to be done at the application layer. So 
that's one way, right? So that's a document-based model, which requires you to do multiple queries uh, in memory joints uh, in the application layer. Is there a better way? Yes, there is graph-based model, right? So now you have entities, uh, and just two entities, users and posts, and there are, there are links between them. These are also uh, that capture information. And when you have this based, uh, this graph-based model, querying becomes much more intuitive. You can say, hey, match users with ID authors, post likes, and users or friends are in this subset, right? So we saw different, different models three different ones specifically relational we saw document base and then graph then each of them have a different complexity on querying it so data modeling and data query go hand in hand so there is no one size that fits all so your use case your application use case you'll have to determine what data model works best what query language that you're going to use with it so as I said, data storage and data retrieval are two main things to consider, right? And depending on the complexity that uh, your data model um, gets, you will have to write complex queries or vice versa. If, you, if your data model is simple, then you will have to write simpler queries for your business application. So remember these two things, data storage, data retrieval go hand in hand, and you'd have to design it based on your use case that works best for you. And so we went through these three different categories, relational database, document database, graph database. There are many, many more, but these are the three general categories that are covered in this book. Um, and there are various optimizations that each one of them provide, right? So if you are, if you have a very fixed structure, right, and you know that's how it's going to be and not going to evolve as much, then your safe bet is a relational database, right? Uh, and there are many commercial and free solutions out there, Oracle, MySQL, Postgre, and then it, it has a very good uh, data query optimizer. It does a lot of things for you that you can just use off the bat, right? So that, that could be one solution. NoSQL is basically not only SQL, right? So it, it allows for flexible schemas. The enforcement at the document data store happens at the read, read level, but in the relational database, the enforcement of the schema happens by the database. So the database would not allow for any rights to go through, it doesn't, in, you know, uh, confer to its schema. And typically, when you use a relational database, you you end up using something like an object relational mapping. As you use an object-oriented programming, you'd want to convert those object representation, in this case, users, into user table. So there's going to be a layer in between that converts a user entity into an active record into a user table. Similarly, in document data store, there'll also be a schema but that is now enforced by the application. So evolving schemas becomes easier. The application knows which schema to use for what entries, mm -hmm. right? So flexible schemas, better performance, especially gives high write throughput. Many examples uh, for this, Couchbase, um, MongoDB, Espresso, a whole host of other stores, they typically use key value stores underneath. Graph database, we looked at that few examples, Neo4j is most common. Uh, Janus DB, Anzo Graph, uh, and various querying language like Spark, QL, um, and Cypher. And for highly interconnected, many-to-many -many relationship uh, uh, data models, this is probably a really good one to consider. It has the benefits of both relations and the document store. It has the agility of the document store, but also provides relationships via those links. So carefully understanding what you application use case you're trying to solve for is very important. Typically, you would see a hybrid, right, which is some sort of a graph data store uh, be between relation and database uh, and document store is, is probably a good route for the future, uh, but you'd have to evaluate based on various examples I showed. Hopefully, it gives us some idea. So in summary, document database's target use cases comes in um, self-constrained documents and relationship between one documents and others are rare, right? So use cases here are like, you know, there's not much relationship. The tree is stored in the document store uh, in, in like one key value pair. And uh, in graph databases, it's an opposite. It, it does both. It has some relationship, but also has the document uh, flexibility of evolving. And there are various examples. Uh, we covered this earlier. Um, the key thing to remember is there's no one solution for what application um, uh, that you're trying to build. There's no one solution for it. You will have to take the pros and cons of each of these things that we described and then evaluate what data store, what query language works really well for you so that you are iterating, but at the same time, solving for the business problems as quickly as possible. Thanks. See you in the next chapter.